So I'm Andrew Weiss. I'm Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment. Thank you all for being here this evening. It's a great privilege to welcome Simon Ostrovsky from Vice News. Uh, we've just watched a compilation of episodes from uh, the very pioneering work, Russian Roulette, that Simon and his team have done in Ukraine, uh, dating back to the takeover of Crimea in, in uh, late February. Um, Simon's background uh, is well known to most people. He's a former documentary filmmaker, former journalist. Um, and I'd like to sort of, when we get this conversation going, I'm sort of curious, how did you come up with the format that you are using in Ukraine? Was this something that developed spontaneously? Did the people at Shane Smith and Vice News deliberately think that you were going to break the format and the stranglehold of what television is and, and how news is conveyed? I think it sort of happened uh, organically. Uh, we didn't plan it. We didn't plan for Crimea. We had no idea Crimea was going to happen. And we just went out there um, and we decided that we, you know, this was going to be very different for Vice because we we're going to be reporting on a breaking event, um, which is something that Vice has never really done before. So we took an editor with us into the field, um, which was a change. And uh, we had a cameraman and you know myself. And uh, you know we realized that we can't compete with CNN or um, any of the other networks for speed. So I think what happened was we found this sort of uh, golden uh, middle in terms of the length of the report and the speed with which it comes out. So it's not like a documentary, which comes out a couple of months after when everybody's already forgotten about the event and you get a really personal look into all of the characters. Um, but it's also not like the news where you, know, you see it the day that something happened. Our stuff came out two, three days later. But it was long enough, I think, to give people some depth um, so that they could understand the story a little better. And you know, people didn't mind that it didn't come out on the day. You know, a lot of people don't really care about breaking news. They want to just see something interesting. And um, I, I think we just stumbled upon you know, a new format. So you've worked in print. You've now really, I think, broken through as a person creating a totally different genre of news. You're originally, you were born in Moscow. You moved to the West at a relatively tender age. Um, why did you feel like this was the story you wanted to cover? Because you've covered the Middle East. You've covered North Korea. Did you think this would be something where you had an edge, and that was what it was? Or was it just this was spontaneous, and sort of in the ethos of Vice News, this was just happening, and you had to do it? When the problems in Ukraine started, I was in uh, Sochi covering the Olympics. And I was watching all of the events on Maidan um, over the television screen, um, but watching them you know, through the Russian lens on like Russia 24. And just seeing that was really shocking for me, you know, just the language that the Russian media were using about what was happening. Um, just scared me to death um, because I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before. It was so so intense that you know fascists have come to power and there's a junta and a coup and then you know you saw the fighting in the streets as well and people were suddenly dying in Kiev because for the preceding couple of months I just tuned the protests in Ukraine out because I'd been to the Orange Revolution of 2005. I'd had enough of sort of Ukraine you know protests and then um, all of that developing into something that you know, eventually failed. So I, I didn't really want to pay attention to it. I felt like I've been there, done that. Um, and uh, anyways, uh, we had another reporter in, in Kiev covering the story. So it wasn't really up to me. Um, then Crimea started, you know, a couple of weeks after things uh, ended in, uh, in, in Kiev, um, maybe even less. But, you know, I just told my editor, something's happening in Crimea, and we should go down there um, because it's really weird. You know, there was just a few pictures of soldiers around the Crimean parliament, um, you know, clashes between the local Tatars and the local Russian population, um, and it just seemed too interesting to pass up. So you're based in New York, and of course I, I can you know, attest that every dinner table conversation in New York probably doesn't revolve around the situation in Ukraine. But in Washington, you'd be surprised. Uh -huh. uh, I've been at any number of events where you have senior former US officials or people who still work for the government, and inevitably everyone brings up Vice News at some point in the conversation. And there's someone at the table who's never seen it, mm -hmm. and then three or four of us will tackle the person and say, you absolutely have to, to pay attention to this. And I remember in early March 2014 thinking that there's a dividing line between like watching these episodes and, under and having a preconceived uh, view of the conflict shattered. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, when you were on the ground in eastern Ukraine, as things really started to spin out of control, did you 
feel that you were in the midst of something that was going to just peter out? Because I think, you know, now looking back, there was a real sense that this didn't necessarily, this, you know, the Russians were just kind of, or the forces arrayed uh, at Moscow's behest, didn't really know what they were doing, and yeah. they were trying stuff. Did you feel like you were watching a bunch of experiments unfold, and like some days things weren't that scary, and then the next day things suddenly were really extreme? Well, I don't make predictions anymore because, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly being surprised by this thing in Ukraine. And uh, I, I never expected uh, Russia to annex Crimea. I'm, you know, the entire time I thought this is Putin flexing muscles, um, showing the world what he can do um, and sort of posturing. But, you know, I, I felt that at the last moment he was going to, you know, back down and, um, uh, and people were going to come to some kind of an arrangement. And, um, I was as surprised as anybody uh, when, when Crimea got annexed. And you know, now I just, uh, I don't know what to expect anymore. So one of the things that you've done, which I, I don't, you know, I assume this is not that different from what a war correspondent does, is you're really in the middle of dangerous situations. And in the videos, there's this constant back and forth between you narrating and action. And there's a scene in one of the episodes in the Orlivka police station where you're actually standing next to the chief of police who's carrying a machine gun wearing full battle kit and the camera sort of pans to you and you're within two feet of him mm -hmm. as he's trying to negotiate his exit. Was that the worst it got until the point when you were abducted where you felt that you were getting too close to dangerous situations and did you at times feel that this was not sustainable and you had to pull back? Well, up until that point, I think that was maybe the... Mm, second most dangerous situation that we'd been in because uh, we'd also actually been sort of detained for uh, a little while by um, pro-Russia forces in Crimea. We were released pretty quickly. But, you know, at that time, you know, we were specifically targeted and, and detained. So um, that could have gone south. Um, you know, the situation in Horolivka could have gone south too, but, you know, their anger was focused on the police. And um, the interesting thing about, like, a riot situation like that is that when the crowd has... Um, you know, a target for its anger, the journalists are pretty safe. But as soon as things calm down um, and people start, you know, thinking about what to do with their excess energy and adrenaline and anger, they start looking for, like, local enemies. And you're the guy with the camera who doesn't look like he's from around there. You're wearing this stupid helmet and this big press thing, and they come up to you, and it's all your fault. And that's actually exactly what happened after Horlifka. Why we didn't stay for that scene... Um, where the uh, lieutenant colonel introduces himself to the police um, was because uh, Freddy, um, our cameraman, uh, got attacked by the crowd and his camera was broken. And so we had to get out of there really quickly. Um, that's obviously not on camera because the camera got broken. But um, that, was, that, was, that was pretty intense. But you know, the war really escalated after that. And um, a shell coming crashing down through a wall is a lot more dangerous can be a lot more dangerous than a crowd of uh, angry people um, because you know a piece of shrapnel can just slice your head off. So before we get to the escalation period, one of the things that I think people have been slowly appreciating in the West is the role that facilitators played in creating the environment we have today. And if you watch the episodes, uh, particularly the one in Horlivka, but then there's another one which we've seen where Ukrainian forces are being disarmed, there's a level of professionalism that certain people in the crowd demonstrate where they mm -hmm. storm the police station. And you can see, we, we were talking about this during the, the screening, you can see this former GRU Colonel Desler, who becomes a very notorious figure during this phase. You can see him walking into the building. And you can see people facilitating the removal of the beaten police chief, mm -hmm. who are kind of trying to tell the crowd back off. He's done what you asked him to do. Was that clear to you at various points in this period that there were these unusually talented people <coughs> who were helping speed events and guide crowds and kind of you know, stage manage what looked like chaos but was more yeah. at someone's behest. Agents provocateurs, sort of. They, or they, as we now know, Russian special forces and intelligence personnel. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, well, I think we understood that even in Crimea, even before it started in uh, eastern Ukraine. Because it started out in eastern Ukraine uh, under the same template. Uh, as was used in Crimea, where, um, okay, in eastern Ukraine it was more, they were sending the crowds of people uh, against police stations. In Crimea, they were sending them primarily against military bases. 
Um, but, uh, but, you know, the format was identical. Um, people from uh, pro-Russia activist groups um, that existed in eastern Ukraine and, and Crimea predated um, the conflict uh, were sort of mobilized uh, by uh, these leaders, you know, just like you, just like you said. And, you know, there were some people in the crowds who were more agitated than others, and they needed to be uh, tampered down a little bit because, um, you know, there was, a, I guess, a, a PR aspect of the whole thing to manage. I, I think Crimea was so successful for Russia because there were so few casualties. Um, uh, and I think initially that's what they wanted to see happen in eastern Ukraine, but then I think the plan got out of hand when um, the Ukrainians decided to fight back as a country. So you spent some time in the early phase of the conflict seeing these kind of ragtag, oddball people who were elevated suddenly to being the mayor of Slavyansk, right? Mm -hmm. Who's this kind of you know, guy in a hoodie and he's got a black hat on and he looks like a drug addict. I mean, he looks, you know, he just doesn't look like the, you know, he's not Mike Bloomberg. No. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm just curious, later on I've seen, I think, in most, one of the most recent batch of interviews, you're with uh, Saharchenko, who's now the, one of the leaders of the DNR, the Donetsk mm -hmm. Republic. Have you seen the leadership change, or is it just that these guys can be sort of cycled in to fill a, you know, an established role? It's changed so many times, actually. I mean, you've got, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the, the third or fourth incarnation of the leadership in uh, uh, eastern Ukraine by now. And um, I think the people, people get removed and then are banned from coming back to eastern Ukraine as it, as it seems to me, as it fits you know, whatever Russia's policy uh, is at the time. And a lot of the leadership of the separatists are actually more radical um, than um, the Russian leadership in Russia. And so I think when they see that people are getting either too popular or out of control and they try to sideline them, put new people forward. And we've seen that happen, you know, uh, with um, Ponomaryov, uh, the, the mayor who was responsible for my captivity. He was, you know, then replaced by Strelkov. Strelkov had arrested him, Strelkov Girkin. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, Girkin himself, after he left to Donetsk, was then sidelined too. Um, and he had to go back to Russia. And both of those figures live in Russia now, uh, in uh, sort of exile from the conflict, uh, and aren't even allowed to appear on uh, Russian TV anymore. Um, and uh, they've actually been trying to get in touch with various foreign media um, so that they could get their position across their radical position in terms of, you know, comparison to the Russian position. Because they want to continue the fight and they want to expand the territory and I don't think that that's what Russia's interest is at the moment. I don't think that Russia wants to join Eastern Ukraine um, to the country in the same way that it did uh, Crimea. I think for them, um, right now at least, and you know, this paradigm could shift at any moment, but right now the conflict in Eastern Ukraine for Russia is a tool for pressuring the Ukrainian central authorities, and by extension, the West. Um, and all they have to do is turn up the heat uh, you know, on the conflict, get the people who they support to start fighting, make it look like uh, Ukraine is about to collapse, and then they can get the Ukrainian authorities to agree to anything. And again, by extension, the uh, Western authorities to agree to something. So I'm going to ask you two more questions, then hopefully we'll open things up and have folks participate in the conversation. If you go back to Eastern Ukraine, as I assume you will, and you find yourself now in the presence of either separatist leaders or people who are kind of organizing things as mm -hmm. opposed to the, 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 troop on, the trooper on the ground, how would you describe what's different now? Is this uh, still a ragtag bunch? Is there a level of professionalism that surprises you? Like, how would you characterize the separatists that you're seeing on the ground right now and the, the mid-level leadership? that you're encountering when you're, when you're doing your work? It's definitely more organized than it was at the very beginning, but I, I still probably wouldn't call it like a totally professional operation. Um, and there's a lot of difference between, uh, you know, the situation in Lugansk. It's harder to operate in Lugansk areas, uh, especially the areas uh, controlled by Cossacks who refuse to even, um, you know, coordinate their activities uh, often with the sort of authorities of the Lugansk People's Republic. Um, and then in, in Donetsk, it's a much sharper operation, um, you know, where they organize like press meets and they've got like a list of schedules of meetings and they've got all of the um, symbols and flags and, um, you know, the whole city has been transformed. 
uh, I think, yeah, you know, I think they've had some consultation from Moscow on that. So the other half of this conflict is the Ukrainian force, which is also a bit of a grab bag of mm -hmm. professional military and volunteer units. I'm just sort of curious how you would describe today. I don't know when the last time as you were around the Ukrainian units, but I'm sort of curious what, how you would describe the conditions there, the quality of morale, of the equipment, the level of morale, uh, in the sense that, you know, this is a, is, is it a more capable force or is it a force that's really uh, also not quite professionalized and uh, ready? Yeah, th there's a difference between what the Ukrainian army was a year ago and what it is now, but there's not a massive difference between what the Ukrainian army was in February when they lost the Baltseva and what they are now. And I think that's the key thing to remember is that even if they're you know, better than they used to be, they're still not good enough to hold something when there's a concerted effort to take it from them. Um, and especially when you have uh, you know, evidence of Russian troops being involved in that fight, um, the Ukrainians just can't stand up. And not only can't they stand up, but they can't even uh, withdraw in an organized manner or know when to cut their losses. I almost feel like the military leadership in, uh, you know, the leadership of the military um, in, in Ukraine have uh, like a sort of Stalinist view of how war should be waged, which is that you should never retreat. And so then they leave it up to the panicking soldiers to retreat, leaving all of their equipment behind um, instead of having, you know, saved that equipment and, and retreated at an earlier point. Um, and I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just bad organization. Maybe it's because nobody wants to be the guy who ordered the retreat to be um, then uh, called a traitor afterwards for having done it. But you know, there's something there's something missing there. Well, look. Let's open things up now. Um, a couple of basic ground rules. If uh, you would ask a question as opposed to uh, extending a, a long comment, so that plenty of people here in the room who have great expertise and background on these issues get a chance to to have a, a question to Simon. Um, and then also identify yourself before speaking. So, please, over here. Uh, Simon, wait. And there's also, a, on third, there's a microphone, so if you would just wait for the microphone. Uh, first of all, Simon, thank you for jo uh, joining us here. Uh, my name is Ruben Gazirian. I'm an Eastern European analyst in Washington, D.C. You kind of alluded to this in this previous question. Um, how would you, or why would you describe that there's a difference in how developed the DNR is to the LNR? Um, is there something in the leadership? Is it Russia's support? Or basically, how would you describe that difference? Thank you. <coughs> Mm, you know, I, I, to be honest, I really don't know the answer. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the LNR is closer to the Russian border, um, and uh, so maybe the political leadership there is more dependent and weaker, and then you know, the DNR leadership have to be more independent somehow and look after things. And also, they're the face of the, um, the two separatist republics because they're closer to the Ukrainian um, front line and all of the journalists come through there. But, you know, that's just guesses, to be honest. I, I don't really know. Can you talk about the Cossacks in Luhansk and sort of what your experience has been around them? Do they basically seem to be a force unto themselves? Are they accountable to someone? They seem like a force unto themselves. They do, because uh, when you're driving through their areas, we were actually on our way to meet, um, you know, another one of the local rebel leaders uh, when we were pulled over by some Cossacks at a checkpoint who said, you have to come meet our leader because he's much better than the guy you want to see. He's a much stronger <laughs> fighter. Um, and so he sort of derailed us uh, for about two hours and sat us down and gave us, you know, tea and told us how great he was and, um, and, and then sent us on our way. So, you know, in that sense, they kind of do what they please. And is this the one that had all the, the sort of bizarre rules about single women shouldn't be allowed out at night, right? Was, or am I rem misremembering? Um, there was, there was a Cossack leader I think you interviewed who really made his mark by being sort of almost like 19th century, 17th century kind of social norms that he was trying to impose on the region. Well, the, we were on our way to see a guy called Musgavoy who had had a people's court um, set up where they tried some uh, looters uh, and uh, alleged rapists, you know, by a show of hands and that caused quite a scandal. Um, you know, that's the story that we were derailed from, from covering by Kazitsyn, um, who's a Cossack from Russia, um, who I think maybe is, uh, was doing the stuff that you were talking about. Peter Redway, if you just wait for the mic. Um, Peter Redway from George Washington University. Do you see any process at the grassroots in Donetsk and Lugansk whereby people are becoming more impatient with the poor administration 
and the lack of a good choice of food and uh, interrupted education and that sort of thing to the point where the local leaders are in danger of losing a lot of popular support. I think people who feel that way generally leave the area. Um, unless you know they have absolutely no other options, but I don't think that there's a kind of potential for um, the population rising up uh, and destabilizing the leadership because of its unpopularity. If if it exists, it's hard to say because people in that area don't want to talk about how they really feel um, because that's a dangerous thing to do, and that's and that's the reason that that wouldn't work. Is um, you know we look at things from the perspective of. Uh, how mechanisms work in a democracy, but over there, if you went out onto the central square and started protesting against the authorities, then that's a very uh, quick path to the basement for you, you know, or worse. Um, and so I think, you know, you have to look at it from the point of view of this is, you know, this is a war. Um, there's no, like, sort of democratic process, and it, it doesn't really matter what the people think at the end of the day, because they're not the ones with the guns. Hi, Jeff Trimble from U.S. International Broadcasting. First, it's great. Uh, thank you for using the Svoboda material in your, in your uh, reporting. Please use more because they're doing a great job. Thanks a lot. Um, my <laughs> question is about feedback to your content. Um, while your narrative is in English, there's, there's a lot of Russian in it. And, of course, a lot of people in Ukraine and in Russia speak enough English that they could consume your content and, and react to it. Mm -hmm. What kind of reactions do you get to your materials from people in Ukraine and even more important from my perspective, from people in Russia. And what underlies that is how in the world can we start to change the narrative and start to get Russians thinking differently about what's actually happening in that part of the world as opposed to what they're getting from their own media. And I know that's a big discussion and we can talk more during the reception. Thanks. Yeah, um, you know, to be honest, I don't think there's really any way to change uh, public opinion in Russia um, because the, uh, most of the population gets their news from Russian television, and it's a very small proportion of people who would watch stories like mine. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something we were talking about earlier, but uh, it's relentless, you know, the, the Russian television news. Um, and people worry about the United States' perception in Russia and, and not making the wrong move and not wanting to turn ordinary Russian people against the United States, but I don't think that's a... I mean, I think we've passed that point. Um, Russians' perception of the United States and you know, the outside world at large doesn't depend on what the United States does. It depends on how, it, when making policy decisions regarding, regarding Russia. Are you hearing from people in Ukraine and Russia about your reports, though? Are you getting any feedback? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's the comments under YouTube videos, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not voice them here. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and, and the occasional charming email. Yeah. Please. I'm Bryce Jordan from uh, Georgetown University. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I'm just thinking specifically about your recent interview with uh, Zakharchenko mm -hmm. and kind of how dismissive and really rude he was uh, to you. And I'm just thinking, and I was thinking when I was seeing that, uh, you know, does a certain uh, reputation precede you now, especially in the wake of the uh, detention, and uh, how, has, how has your reputation changed with the separatist leadership specifically? I think some people know me out there. I think some people don't know me. Maybe they've heard of me, but they don't know exactly who I am. I don't think I'm as famous as I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that, uh, you know, for the separatist leadership, there is an interest in, in continuing to allow um, the foreign media to report, uh, even if they don't like their reporting a lot of the time. Why? Because the Kremlin doesn't control what we say. And they don't always see eye to eye with the Kremlin. The Kremlin controls the Russian journalists who are in eastern Ukraine, so even if they give an interview, as they regularly do to a Russian channel, um, they, uh, they know that you know, what's actually published is going to be managed. Um, and so if they're making you know, radical statements about wanting to you know, take over Mariupol, that might not get reported uh, in the Russian press, but if a Western journalist takes that interview, he'll publish those words, and, and that's what they want to see happen. Could you talk a little bit about how the Western press presence in Eastern Ukraine has changed? You don't want to 
want to deal with this anymore, and it's no longer interesting. Well, it's like with any story, you know, there's an uptick when uh, when there's a lot of bang bang, and then when there isn't, you know, people leave and go and do other things. I think that's like quite natural and to be expected. And I don't know if there's really anything that can be done with that. But you know, we're trying to stick with the story as much as possible. Obviously, not there right now. There's always stories to be doing there. You know, I think even when there's not a lot of explosions and so forth, you know, there's always some interesting investigations that you could do. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have, you know, with the Russian Roulette series, like quite a sizable following. So anything we put on that playlist, you know, people get a notification about it and they'll watch it. And that's really good for us and that like encourages, I think, uh, my editors to continue it. Um, because we've got a different model than, you know, CNN does um, because of the way, you know, YouTube works. Simple as that, is that, you know, if you subscribe to something and there's a lot of uh, subscribers to your uh, material, then you can, you know, get an audience for it, even, even, if, there's, even if it's not, like, on the global headlines at, the, at this very instant. And who's the bulk of the audience right now? Like, who do you think is the most diehard? I think it's, like, 50% uh, United States and then 50% the rest of the world. And then the rest of the world divides into a quarter of it is uh, Ukraine and Russia. And then a quarter of it is just, you know, random people all over the place. And is it, you know, Vice's calling card is that it's heavily millennial. Is that true in this case? Or do you think it's skew, the age skew is different? That part, I don't know. I haven't looked at those statistics. But I know it skews, like, heavily towards males. So I think maybe 70, 80 percent of our viewership are males. And do you think that drives what you're, what you know will do well? And, like, are you measuring your performance on views and on audience size? I mean, I think we're trying to expand our appeal, but the thing is we report a lot on conflict, and I think you know, young guys are more interested in conflict than young girls. Jessica Matthews. Oh, Jessica Matthews from Carnegie. I'm interested in the Ukrainian army, such as it was a year ago, and what we saw there in instances where they were well-equipped. <laughs> Um, were they demoralized, um, uh, turned over by their leaders? Uh, I mean, there, it seemed like there were some episodes there where they were not facing overwhelming force at all, and they could have they fought, which is what armies are supposed to do. Yeah. Well, this is an army that uh, had existed in a country that was at peace for 23 years. There were certain parts of the army that had participated um, in the American-led efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq, but those were, you know, very small and limited units. And the rest of the army at large, you know, the conscripts, they, I don't think they ever expected to fight, and I don't think they went into the army um, ever hoping to fight either. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that people in the army really believed in the cause either. Um, the, the Ukrainian army over the last 23 years was essentially a vehicle for the generals to enrich themselves. It wasn't it wasn't there for providing any kind of defense because I think nobody in Ukraine ever imagined that Russia could uh, attack their territory. I think that was so far beyond anybody's perception that they never even made plans for fortifying their eastern frontier. All of the, all of the exercises that they did had always happened on the western side. So I, I just think that you know, it took a while for people to catch up with the reality. Really, and there's also a big difference between the volunteer and battalions. You know, by definition, volunteers have better morale um, than conscripts who, you know, have just been called up by the draft office. Um, so, the, the 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 morale was good in the volunteer battalions. It was over the top, to be honest, um, and there was no morale in the rest of the army. People didn't want to be out east; they wanted to be back home. So, there's a pretty. In Iraq, in the fall of '03, it's visiting some of the coalition forces, having an American general say to me that of all the useless members of the coalition, the most useless was the Ukrainian delegation. That's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, there's obviously a long-standing debate in Washington about whether the U.S. should get more directly involved. And one of the ways people talk about that would be through some form of more direct military assistance to the mm -hmm. Ukrainians. Do you think we're in a situation where that kind of assistance would be a big change on the ground? Or is there just a sort of structural mismatch 
between what you know has been applied so far to pressure the Ukrainians versus you know the uh, the relatively limited capabilities of the Ukrainians themselves. Well, luckily I'm a reporter, so I don't have to make that call. I just kind of observe and, and criticize and uh, never have to face any of the consequences myself. Well, sometimes, but you know, most of the time not. Um, so I don't really know what the answer is there. Um, I you know, personally um, wonder what the utility of uh, giving weapons to a country that um, you know, produces so many weapons is. And if, uh, if the Ukrainians don't want to unify you know, as a nation properly for the war effort, including um, getting their military industrial complex straight. You know, they, they're the ninth biggest weapons exporter in the world, so they could maybe curtail some of those exports and send them to their army, figure out some of their problems with corruption before they blame the rest of the world for abandoning them. Because the other uh, side of that coin is that if you do give them weapons, you know, you don't know if they're going to make it to the right people. And, or whether they're going to be, get left behind like they did in uh, Debaltseva because of those command problems that we were talking about before. Okay. Tanya Lakot, who's actually from Luhansk, if I'm yeah, not you stole, mistaken. stole my line. Um, yeah, thank you for reporting on my hometown. Um, I'm Tanya. I write for Renet Echo at Global Voices, and I'm from Luhansk. So my question to you is, how did you manage to sort of negotiate your this double identity of like being an American but also being kind of a, a Soviet child? I'm also one. Um, did you figure out th through time that there were moments and places where it was better to be the American guy? I mean, you're obviously also a journalist. That's another hat you wear. Mm -hmm. And then other places where it's like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I understand. Like, I, I speak your language, and not just because you speak Russian. They're, you know, the short, the sort of the, sh the shorthand. Like, when, when were those moments? Mm, I, I mean, I've always kind of been... Um, you know, a foreigner wherever I went. So here in the United States growing up, I was from Russia. And then when I moved back to Russia when I was 17, I was from America. Um, so I've kind of got really used to that role, and I, I just don't give it too much thought. But I think it's great, and I'm really thankful to my family for keeping up Russian, um, you know, while we were growing up here. Because uh, without it, I don't think I would have been able to start as a journalist in Russia. I wouldn't have got my first, you know, job um, that, that got me started. So. Um, it's not really something that I devote a terrible amount of thought to. And do you feel that the people you're interacting with throughout the conflict have pegged you as a foreigner? Do they look at you and they obviously figure out? Yeah, people foreign? insist on calling me Simon, even though my name in Russian is Simon. And even if I tell you, <laughs> even if I tell you three or four times, hi, my name is Simon, they'll still insist on calling me Simon because they just want me or consider me to be a foreigner. My name's Simon. <laughs> if we're speaking Russian, you can call me Simon in English. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Blasenko, uh, general Eurasianist and close observer of Russia and uh, Central Asia, but also more recently Ukraine, of course, and a general fan of your selfless and raw reporting. So thank you. Um, we've heard from the perception and uh, from Russia's perception of what's going on and the lack of understanding there. But what would you rate the understanding here in the West and where it can be helped, where it's gone wrong, and how it's changed throughout your reporting and coverage of the area? Mm, that's a good question. It's a tough question to answer. I think that people's perceptions here are closer to reality than people's perceptions are in the United States, uh, in, uh, in Russia, um, simply because, you know, there's not a controlled narrative. And there are just so many different medias that you can choose from to get your news from. And so people just get a more balanced uh, opinion if they're interested. And the other problem is that not everybody's interested. So um, that just means that uh, a lot of people aren't following. Yes, please. Alexander Melikishuli, IHS. Uh, thank you, Simon, for your comments, which I find very informative. and. And Thank you for calling me Simon. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad to see you safe and sound, first of all. Thanks. Um, my question has to do with your experience. Chronologically speaking, you were there at the early stages of the conflict. But based on your experiences, you know, you witnessed uh, the motley crew of uh, mar marginal elements from Russia uh, coalescing there. Do, what's your sense of the control? You mentioned control from Moscow, but how tangible is that control? In other words, do you see a, a, 
as this situation developing further, mm -hmm. a possibility for uh, folks just going on their own completely. Thank you very much. Mm. I think it would be hard for them to go alone completely. I mean, if we're talking about the separatists taking things into their own hands and completely rebelling against uh, whatever the Russian government position is, um, because they depend on them for arms and they depend on them for money. And a lot of the people fighting over there are fighting not for the idea of a greater Russia or uh, you know whatever you want to call it, but they're basically they're either for adventure or for cash. And then you've got like sort of lots of uh, marginal groups um, that are ideological, either far left or far right, or you know with weird religious aspirations. Um, and then of course you know there's the group of soldiers who are just simply. Russian soldiers following orders. Um, and I think the battles of Ilovaisk over the summer, which was a real turning point in the war, that was when um, the Ukrainian forces were progressing uh, very strongly against the pro-Russia separatists. Uh, and they seemed on the point of basically dividing Donetsk from the city of Lugansk by you know, cleaving this uh, area in between them. Um, when for the first time, Russia moved regular troops in to support the, the separatists and uh, essentially won the battle for them and, and turned the whole war around. So, you know, I think what that shows is that the separatists and the Ukrainians are pretty evenly matched, but the Ukrainians have a um, superiority and can win when it's just against the separatists. Um, so the separatists need, need Russia, because if, without Russia, I think it would have all been over a long time ago. Please. Hi, uh, Andriti, uh, State Department. My question is, what's your sense of the, uh, the current uh, armaments capacity, production capacity um, for the, uh, the rebel regions, separatist regions, and um, their current arsenal? What do you estimate, and how do you think that matches up with uh, public US estimates? I don't know. I don't think they produce weapons in eastern Ukraine. Um, you went to the one factory, though, where they were sort of refurbing tanks. Yeah, I went to a factory that was like a repair facility. Okay. But they weren't actually you know, making tanks from scratch. They, that, that, that's, there's a pretty well-known like, facility in Donetsk where um, they like to take the journalists to show them all of the equipment. Um, that they've taken from the Ukrainians and repainted or fixed up or cannibalized for spare parts um, because the official position of the separatist authorities is that all of their equipment uh, was uh, captured from the Ukrainians and that they didn't get anything from Russia, but that's not true. Um, but that's the reason you get so many reports out of that particular facility. And what do you think their current sort of arsenal looks like? You know, you'll hear 1,000 tanks, you'll hear, you know, 40, 50,000 troops. What, what's your sense of that? No idea. I mean, it's just too big for me to understand, you know, as one person. Uh, thank you. Uh, Simon, I, I think that next time you are in Donetsk, you have to call your Semyon. That's better. That's better. That's a real Russian name because Simon is not Russian. Name. You see, this is what I was telling you. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why you are foreign. That's why uh, I get this all the time. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned that uh, people who are in these uh, regions who support uh, Ukraine, they have left. Is it fair to say that if referendum on the future of Donetsk and Luhansk is run is today, the majority will vote against any strong ties with Ukraine and will vote for federalization or separatization, I don't know, confederation? Um, you know, I think uh, a referendum in the conditions of war is really pointless. I mean, it's not... Take, take, take into account that let's imagine no war today. Okay. And only those who leave, they vote. Well, they would probably vote for uh, separation or, or joining Russia, I think. Because I think, you know, in that part of the world, people have a, uh, a very keen sense of uh, what the, you know, the political, which way the political wind is blowing at the time. And it's almost a matter of survival to internalize the correct political position. And any referendum organized uh, under the supervision of the separatist authorities, I think, would essentially um, mean that people have to vote for 
whatever the official position is of the separatist authorities. And we saw that um, during the last referendum that they held, um, that uh, they tied uh, voting to uh, getting social benefits. So you weren't able to, in some towns, get your uh, humanitarian card um, unless you went and participated in the referendum. Let's move two more questions. Oh, three, we got three, three more. Thank you, my name is Daniel Heinz from Eurasia Foundation. I have a question about what the kind of casual atmosphere was like working among other journalists. Was it kind of a collaborative effort where if something big happened, you would all call each other up and alert them to it? Or were you mostly working independently? And also, what was it like working alongside the pro-Kremlin uh, state-run media? Um, was there a kind of animosity between the Western journalists and the Kremlin journalists? Uh, it was really great working with all the other reporters and um, uh, all of my colleagues were also doing really amazing work and going to all of the crazy places and seeing all of the crazy things that we were seeing and um, sending their reports to their outlets. And, you know, oftentimes we'd collaborate and get in one car together, um, you know, with independent Russian journalists. Like I mentioned in one of the videos that we had a journalist with us who had a Russian passport who helped us get through uh, pro-Russia checkpoints. And, you know, we extended the same favor to him when we were on the other side of the lines um, going through uh, Ukrainian checkpoints. I'd sit in the front seat with my American passport and, you know, wave it at the Ukrainians and we helped each other out in that way. Um, wasn't really a lot of uh, hanging out with the Russian official media. Um, I think you know we all sort of understood what the situation was, and um, you know sometimes you don't want to see what's going on in the kitchen because then you have to do something about it. Um, and I, just the, I think a lot of what they did, they tried to do away from prying eyes, anyways. Um, these days, though, if you are in Donetsk and the situation is more or less calm. Uh, you know, there's a lot of press junkets that the local authorities organize, and inevitably you're going to be with a really big group of Russian journalists if you go along on one of those. And, you know, they look at you funny. But. So right now there's a lot of focus, I think, in Washington about the prospect for escalation mm -hmm. in the sense that more equipment's flowed in, there's, you know, this advanced uh, anti-aircraft capability, and there's greater command and control and consolidation. Um, do you have a plan for how to cover that, assuming this sort of period of anticipation, and uh, particularly in and around Mariupol, continues? I mean, what, what's your next map, your next step? Well, yeah, the plan is like buy an airplane ticket, and fly to Kiev, and you know, get on a train and go there. That's the whole plan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So maybe two more questions right back there. Um, Jackie Labua, also from Eurasia Foundation. So I was wondering, which news sources would you recommend following for those of us, those of us following the conflict that are doing really innovative reporting, other than Vice? Oh, well, then I wouldn't recommend anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, you know, the New York Times has done really amazing reporting. Um, uh, who else? Um, the BBC has been doing really good uh, reporting. Um, you know, all of the sort of major outlets that you're used to watching, they do do good reporting. I, I think the mainstream media gets a bad rap. I don't know why. No, I, I'd say that, at least in this institution, I think we recognize that it's actually really hard to understand what's going on, and it's actually the Western correspondents who are there who've really helped us understand a lot better the fabric of the societies that have been under mm -hmm. all this pressure, but also what the battlefield looks like. I think it's, you know, there's this idea that, you know, it would be, you could understand anything without the work that people are doing for BuzzFeed, the Wall Street yeah. Journal, the New York Times. I mean, it's, it would not the be. The Guardian, yeah, you know, everybody. Be. Yeah. It's like, I mean, nobody's, like, consistently brilliant. Um, and, uh, but all of those uh, outlets have produced some really amazing uh, reports. I especially like some of the ones the New York Times does, like, a year after something's happened, and they dissect, um, you know, events by interviewing just a whole whack load of people and giving you a perspective. Like the story they did about the uh, hours before Yanukovych fled. I thought that was a really good one. Okay, so one more question. Okay, no, two, two more, two more, that's fine, that's fine. Hello, Peter Sadler from Atlanta Council. Thank you very much for taking the time to come out here. I wanted to ask a question about the internal governance of the DNR and the LNR. 
Um, we read a lot, ar a lot around here that um, pre existing channels of corruption, criminal organizations, even the mafia every now and again wind up running the territories that they get occupied and kind of drafted into these separatist structures. But in a lot of the clips that we just watched, it seemed a lot like normal people were out there protesting or rallying around the military to um, mm -hmm. push for the separatist agenda. So in your experience, um, how would you characterize the relationship between the separatists, organized crime networks already existing there, and then these kind of mass demonstrations that popped up initially? Did they phase out over time? Did organized crime step in? How has this unfolded? Thank you. Well, initially, I think they were trying to replicate what happened in Crimea, and they didn't want to see any casualties. They just wanted to see overwhelming popular support for Russia and for that to solve the problem, um, for, you know, for the Russians, at least. Um, but that didn't happen. Um, and so those methods were quickly sidelined. I mean, you know, bringing out uh, pro-Russia supporters and, and using just ordinary people. Um, and it became an armed conflict, and it just became about uh, who, was, who had the guns, and that's, that's what the conflict is about now. It's not really, nobody's asking the local population what they think uh, on either side. Nobody really cares, it's just, you know, who's got the bigger gun. Spencer Tremblay, I'm not with any organization. Sure. Um, I'm just a cameraman. Uh -huh. um, I, uh, Simon, your work has, uh, you've even commented that this has broken the mold of international news reporting and it's shaken up the, the format and the landscape. Um, you know, have you noticed a difference in the way that other you know, media agencies are reporting now, now that you've, you've kind of been heralded as, as a, 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 you know, a legitimizing voice for Vice and then also changing the format. I mean, what's your, what's your look I'm from really within the I'm really glad you asked that question. <laughs> so what's, you know, what's CNN doing now? Are they changing or? I don't, know, I don't know, I don't watch CNN, but the BBC, um, they really have, uh, you know, sort of imitated our dispatch format. Uh, my friend Natalia Antolava actually told me that her editors told her to do an Ostrovsky, so <laughs> that's out there. Look it up, Natalia Antolava, some of her reporting in Ukraine has been great and she does a good impression of me. <laughs> well look, we're incredibly grateful to you for being so generous with your time. We are uh, in your debt uh, without your reporting. I think people's understanding of what's going on in Ukraine would be far, far uh, diminished and we just wish you all the best and particularly hope you'll stay safe because you're doing things that are quite quite challenging and we're, we're, you're, you'll be in our thoughts. Thank you, Thank you for you inviting so. me. This is really one of the biggest crowds I've ever talked to. So <laughs> it's much easier when you're just staring into the lens of a camera. And <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy. And I hope folks will join us now. We have uh, beer, wine, and pirashki on tap in the back. And please, please stick around and talk to Simon. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Appreciate it.